Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has finally come. We have a new Star Wars movie. And thank God they didn't screw this one up. Oh. I was so afraid that this might end up being another Phantom Menace. Not the case. Not at all. This was really, really good. Now, normally I would start off this vlog by telling you a quick summary of the plot. That's gonna be kind of tricky because... I don't know how much I can tell you without getting into spoilers, because with the trailers and interviews and all that that they've done leading up to this, they have done a really good job of telling us just enough to get us hyped without really telling us a goddamn thing. Like, I can't even tell you the first line of the opening crawl because it is technically a spoiler. Not necessarily something that would surprise you, I think... A lot of us had guessed this is what the movie was going to be about, but still, just in case, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. So let me see what I can tell you. Um, I can tell you that this takes place about 30 years after Return of the Jedi, and the Rebel Alliance has formed a new Republic, but the Empire never really went away. And what was left of the Empire has formed what they call the First Order, which is led by General Hux, Captain Phasma, who is kind of the head stormtrooper, Kylo Ren, who is kind of sort of the new Sith Lord, or at least he's a Sith wannabe, and the shadowy figure Supreme Leader Snoke. And going up against the First Order is a group that calls themselves the Resistance, which is backed by the Republic. Not entirely sure how that works out, they never made it very clear, but anyway, the Resistance is led by General Leia. She is not a princess anymore, she is now a general. And General Leia has sent X-Wing pilot Poe Dameron, played by Oscar Isaac, on a mission to do... Um... Something very important, we'll put it that way. Along the way, he meets up with Finn, played by John Boyega, and Finn is a... Stormtrooper who was pretty much raised since birth to just be a stormtrooper, but now he's starting to figure out, you know, I think I might be fighting for the bad guys. I guess all the creepy ass helmets kind of gave it away. That and the slaughtering innocent people, that was probably a big tip off as well. But anyway, he ends up switching sides, and Finn, through a strange turn of events, ends up meeting Rey, who is played by Daisy Ridley, and Rey is working as a scavenger on the desert planet of Tatooine, I mean Jakku, and they team up to go on a big journey across the galaxy, eventually meeting up with Han Solo and Chewbacca and Leo and all your favorite characters, except for Lando, because he is nowhere to be found. No Lando Calrissian, 0 out of 10. This movie sucks. No, I'm kidding. So first, let me just say the acting in this movie was fantastic across the board, which is a welcome change from the prequels, let me tell you. But seriously, they all did a fantastic job, the newcomers and the old guard alike. Our new heroes are all very likable, and they all feel like real people with actual genuine personalities. Again, big step up from the prequels. Boyega does a very good job as the reformed Stormtrooper Finn. I really liked his character arc and what he did with this character. And in some scenes, he has to show a lot of emotion while not actually showing his face, especially in some earlier scenes when he just has, you know, the Stormtrooper helmet on and that's all you can see. And he really nails it. Oscar Isaac does a great job as Poe Dameron. He is witty and sarcastic and energetic and a whole lot of fun. He's basically Han Solo 2.0 except not quite as scoundrel-ish. But Daisy Ridley is the one who really steals the show. I really liked the character Rey. She's definitely a very conflicted character. When we first meet her, she is stuck on this horrible backwater planet, just barely eking out a living as a scavenger and longing for a new life. But once fate finally hands her a new life, She's not entirely sure what to do with it and how to react, and she spends so much time just wanting to get back to her god-awful life on Jakku, just because I think it's the only thing she knows, even though, really, there is no going back. Once you got people with lightsabers coming after you, you're not going back. And amazingly enough, going into this movie, we didn't know a whole lot about her backstory, and now that I've seen the movie... I still don't know much about this character. They're definitely saving something for episode 8 with her, because they haven't told us a whole lot, just bits and pieces, really. 
I have my suspicions, of course, but I don't know for sure. And of course, you have the new droid BB-8, and he is every bit as adorable as he looked in the trailers. I really, really love this character. And I still can't believe they found a way to do this character with practical effects. That just blows my mind. And of course, you have the returning heroes from the previous movies, Han Solo, Chewbacca, Princess Le General Leia, excuse me, habit. And you got a few cameos here and there from C-3PO and R2-D2, and even Admiral Akbar shows up. But again, no Lando. <sighs> Please tell me he's coming back in Episode 8. And then we have the old Jedi Master himself, Luke Skywalker, who has been strangely absent from all of the trailers and also is not on the poster. There is a very good reason for this. I'm not going to tell you what that reason is, but there is a good reason. You'll just have to trust me on this one. And then we have our villains. Our main villain, of course, is Kylo Ren, played by Adam Driver. And man, this dude is scary. And anytime you introduce a new villain in the Star Wars universe, that person is going to have a huge uphill battle because how do you compete with Darth Vader, who is, in my opinion, one of the greatest movie villains of all time? And you know that kind of factors into Kylo Ren's story in a way because he is very much trying to be the new Darth Vader but doesn't really know how to do it. And this is a major struggle for him and it's very easy to understand this character's motivation. Even if you don't condone what he's doing, you can still get him. And man oh man, that boy has a temper on him. Oh, he likes to break stuff when shit does not go his way, and that lightsaber comes in handy for that, let me tell you. There's one funny moment when he's going into one of his tantrums and just slicing up a room with his lightsaber. Outside in the hall, a couple of stormtroopers are walking up, and then they hear all the commotion going on in the room. They just stop, look at each other. Nope, turn around. <laughs> I would too, I, I want no part of that. The other villains do a pretty good job, but sadly they're kind of overshadowed by Kylo and don't get nearly as much screen time, which is unfortunate. I was really hoping we'd see more of Captain Phasma, who was played by Gwendolyn Christie, but she's not in all that much of the movie. When she is, she's an intimidating presence to be sure, but I was hoping for a little bit more. But they got two more movies to go, we'll see. And I was not expecting to get a cameo from the cast of The Raid, that was... Definitely a welcome surprise, and that would make a really weird crossover now that I think about it. But yeah, there's a scene where Han Solo is confronted by a couple of gangs of smugglers that he owes money to because he's Han Solo and that's what he does. And one of them is actually led by Iko and Yayan from The Raid. I was like, well, I did not expect that. Sadly, they don't get to do any martial arts moves, but that was still kind of cool. Maybe J.J. Abrams is a fan of The Raid. I don't know. That wouldn't surprise me. The action scenes are a lot of fun, they're very well done. There are a couple of pretty brutal moments in there as well. They definitely earn that PG-13 rating. If you like to see a good space battle, this movie will definitely not disappoint you there. And if you like a good lightsaber battle, ho! Oh, the big one at the end of this movie, very, very well done. I really like that. There are quite a few funny moments in this movie as well, which are also very well done and do not detract from the tone of this movie at all. It's funny when it needs to be, it's serious when it needs to be, it all works very well. The story was pretty good, definitely feels like a Star Wars story. I liked the little Easter eggs that they threw in here and there, like uh, Finn, when he's a stormtrooper, his ID number is FN2187, and 2187 is a number that has a pretty good connection to George Lucas. And also, the First Order's base of operations for this movie is called Starkiller Base. And as you may know, Luke Skywalker was originally going to be called Luke Starkiller. I see what you did there. Now, part of what makes it feel like a Star Wars movie, and this is probably going to be a criticism from a lot of people, is that it does rehash a few plot points from the original trilogy. In the original movie, A New Hope, for example, you have our hero who is living on a desert planet until he finds a droid that's carrying something valuable and he has to go on an adventure to deliver it to the rebels. In The Force Awakens, you have a hero who is living on a desert planet and finds a droid who's carrying something valuable and has to deliver it to the Resistance. Like George Lucas used to say when talking about the original trilogy and the prequels, they rhyme, and 
they rhyme here too. I wasn't personally bothered by this because Star Wars really has always been a tribute to older movies like the old film serials and the works of Kurosawa like Hidden Fortress and stuff like that. So now, when you're moving on to The Force Awakens, it's really just paying tribute to its own history now. Some people will have a problem with this, and I totally understand why, but personally, I wasn't bothered by it. One complaint I do have is there are a couple of things that maybe required a bit more explanation. Like, I'm still not entirely certain how the relationship between the Resistance and the Republic works. We don't really see much of the Republic in this movie. We just kind of have to trust that they're there. And there's also... How can I explain this without spoiling anything? There are certain characters in this movie that are in possession of certain things, and they don't really explain how they came to be in possession of the things. We just have to accept the fact that they have the things, and that it is necessary for them to have the things to move the story along, and why are you overanalyzing this? It's a Star Wars movie, you idiot, shut up. It, it's that kind of thing. And I do think there are a few moments where J.J. Abrams may have gone just a bit over the top, as is his want. Um, apparently, the Force can be used to freeze a laser blast in midair. Really, J.J.? I know, the Force is all-powerful. UNLIMITED POWER! But, really? Also, Starkiller Base. Uh, which you can see in the poster, it's that big thing up in the corner, you know, that's no moon. And it is not a moon, but nor is it really a space station. It is something much bigger, much better, and dare I say it, just a little bit sillier. Just, just a little bit. Granted, it's not the silliest thing in Star Wars. I think there are several moments in the Clone Wars TV series that top it. I've been going through that on Netflix recently because I didn't get a chance to catch it when it was on TV, and there is some really good stuff in there, but man, there is a lot of stupid stuff as well. Voodoo dolls are apparently a thing in Star Wars. Fucking voodoo dolls. Really. But anyway, I'm getting off topic. Now, being a Star Wars movie, of course, there are plenty of special effects, and overall, they were pretty damn good. J.J. Abrams made it a point to focus on using real sets and practical effects, all of which look fantastic. And it's not that you can't use CGI. CGI is a useful tool, but it just looks so much better when the character on screen is interacting with something that is actually there and when they are in a real place and not just standing in front of a green screen. The movie still has CGI, of course, mostly in the space battles, because nowadays there's really no other way you can do that. You kind of have to do them in CGI. You'd be a fool not to. But for the most part, it looks pretty good. But with all the practical effects that went into this movie, there are two characters that are entirely motion-captured CGI. Uh, there's Maz Kanata, who is a character that's apparently an old friend of Han Solo and Chewie. And there's Supreme Leader Snoke, who is the man in charge of the First Order. Now, Maz Kanata I didn't have a huge problem with. She's the character that's uh, played by Lupita Nyong'o. She was okay, I thought. But Supreme Leader Snoke, who is played by Andy Serkis, because who else are you going to get for a motion capture performance... Him, oh, there was something about this guy that just did not look right, especially compared to everything else in the movie. It didn't look bad, per se, but it wasn't all that great either. And I remember reading an interview with Andy Serkis where he said there really wasn't any way that they could do this character with a prosthetic. I'm not entirely sure I buy that. I'm sure it would be difficult to make a prosthetic that would work this way, and it would definitely be hard on the actor, but I don't know that it would have been impossible, and in fact, I think they would have been better off trying to do... even if they can't just do a convincing-looking prosthetic, maybe a combination of practical and digital, kind of like what they did with Aaron Eckhart's face in The Dark Knight. Something other than a full CGI character would have gone a long way here. I did see the movie in 3D, and the 3D does add to certain parts of the movie, especially the space battles, but I don't think it's absolutely essential. You can probably skip the 3D surcharge and still have a damn good time with this movie. 
As for John Williams' score, honestly, I think this is probably his weakest effort out of all the Star Wars movies. It just, it didn't feel as strong as his previous work. Now, it's still John Williams. Even John Williams on a bad day is still John Williams. <laughs> It's still very well done, just compared to the other movies, this is probably the worst one. Overall, this movie was a ton of fun. I really enjoyed this one. It is probably the third best Star Wars movie that has ever been made, in my opinion, right behind A New Hope and then The Empire Strikes Back, I still put on the top. But yeah, really, really good stuff. Definitely not perfect by any means, although I'll tell you what was perfect. The final shot. The very last shot in this movie, not going to give anything away, but... Mmm. Nailed it. It is an excellent movie, I highly recommend it, and if you are a Star Wars fan and you have not seen this yet, what in God's name are you waiting for? Get out there and see this movie. Go. Go! And I think I've talked for long enough about this movie, so until next time, may the Force be with you.